fellow explorers of the past. Uh, Welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. Back in episode 74, Eleni and I talked about the sort of linked fates of two major cities that were conquered, partially destroyed, in close chronological proximity to each other. Uh, This was Constantinople in the mid-15th century and Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztec Empire in the early 16th. Interestingly, these events were not entirely unrelated, as it was the conquest of Constantinople, the consolidation of Ottoman power in the East, that drove many Italians and Portuguese and Spaniards to look to other outlets for uh, trade routes, especially to the East, and consequently the exploration of the Atlantic and the, quote, discovery of the New World. Now, the fall of both of these cities was lamented in, in, in native literature, but also by others, as they observed, you know, once glorious capitals with architectural natural wonders kind of kind of obliterated in the immediate aftermath of the conquest and then revamped, you know, rebuilt um, to reflect a, a very different uh, governing civilization. And so both of them had to be, in a sense, rediscovered, sort of explored as something that was lost and has to be to reconstituted, uh, even if only in the imagination or in scholarship. And in both cases, this had to be done in large degree from texts, from descriptions, uh, rather than from the actual surviving monuments and topography. Now, I want to say a few words here about the idea of exploration and discovery, especially in 16th century Europe, because it was fantastically important along so many different axes. There was, of course, the discovery from the European perspective of the New World, which shocked a lot of people and caused all kinds of paradigms to collapse and and, uh, scramble to create a new picture of the world. But this was happening at the same time as an ongoing exploration and rediscovery of antiquity. So this is something that had started in the Renaissance and was continuing on into the 16th century. Classical Latin and Greek, the ancient civilizations were being rediscovered at exactly that time. It was also a period when Europeans began to reimagine the future. So they were kind of exploring their own future in a way and eventually writing many utopias uh, about what that might look like. And in the 16th century, this resulted in basically the scientific project, which was an exploration of nature on a very sort of deep systemic uh, level. And a lot of these threads were intertwined. And my favorite example is uh, Machiavelli. I think it's his discourses on the first 10 books of Livy, uh, which is an exploration of an ancient text by a Renaissance uh, you know, thinker, Livy, an ancient historian. But its frontispiece was an image of Columbus's book sailing off to the new world to discover you know, un- unknown lands and new possibilities which in Machiavelli's mind, of course, was the future. It was the future that he was creating for Europe. So all of these projects of exploration and discovery were interlinked in the minds of people active at the time. And in our neck of the woods, in Constantinople, we find that that our first explorer as a way, kind of a scientific project to document the topography and find the monuments of Constantinople, is a Frenchman whom we'll be talking about in this episode, um, whose book was published under the Latin name Petrus Gilius or Pierre Gilles um, uh, in French. And he did an absolutely fantastic job of trying to figure out the layout of the lost medieval city, where all the monuments were in absolute terms in relation to each other, digging through the textual sources, trying to link them up to uh, with the material remains uh, that he was poking about during his stay uh, in the city. Having said that, one thing that struck me when I recently reread his account, um, of which we have uh, two very good uh, translations in English um, now, if, if any of you are interested in uh, looking into the nitty-gritty of his work, is that he often disparages the contemporary inhabitants of the city and specifically the ones whom he calls Greeks, for not knowing these facts about their own city, for not being curious about it, 
for not being able to answer his questions, for being indifferent, and so forth. And this, of course, creates this narrative of knowledge as something that can only be activated by a Western European who has scholarly or proto-scholarly instincts and who's doing a proper job of this, and that the knowledge that he's accumulating in some way belongs to him and the traditions he represents and not to the locals, even though they're the ones who are living in the city, whose ancestors are the ones who built those monuments. And by the way, we know this is not true. So we know of you know, Greek writers in 16th century Constantinople who are interested in the antiquities of their city and who do have traditions about these monuments and the emperors who built them. But these are either unknown to him or ignored or effaced. And in a certain sense, this is exactly parallel to the whole idea of the Europeans discovering the New World on the opposite, on the other end of our spectrum here, because you know, there were people who lived there. They knew about their world. Uh, it's just a very Eurocentric perspective from which this is a discovery of something. Um, and so the, the narrative of the exploration and the discovery and the knowledge that accumulates around it are built from that perspective. We're very familiar with this critique. I'm saying it goes on in the East as well. Uh, these are all very structurally parallel processes. My guest today is Sarah Bassett of Indiana University, and she has done extraordinary work um, on to, uh, Constantinople, its monuments, topography, its history, and what it all means. Um, 20 years ago, exactly, actually, she published uh, a book that has become a standard uh, both analysis and reference work for the field is the urban image of late antique Constantinople. And she very recently edited and published the Cambridge Companion to Constantinople. I think that was last year, a couple years ago. The urban image book showed to many of us at the time just what was possible to do uh, by combining sort of archaeological, mu mu museological, but also the literary sources in uh, to reconstruct uh, in particular, the presence of classical antiquities in uh, the medieval city. I think this book launched many others, in, you know, in, including some articles of my own, um, on some of these monuments. And Sarah gives wonderful talks, and she's a meticulous scholar, and so we cross paths at conferences here and there. And at some point, I must ask her, tell me what, tell me what we can talk about in a podcast. I mean, this, you, surely you have some interesting material that you're working on now. And indeed, I was thrilled when she said that we could talk about the discovery of Constantinople uh, from people like Gilius to the very scattered archaeological excavations that took place uh, down to the, like the 20th century. So I was very happy to have her on as a guest uh, and talk about how the discovery of Constantinople, uh, the mat of material Constantinople, kind of tied in with uh, European occurrence of thought uh, at the time. Here we go. This is my conversation with Sarah Bassett. And thank you also to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes, as always. So here we go. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's very kind of you. Oh, no, it's a pleasure to have you on. You are one of our most important writers on nothing less than Constantinople itself. And um, it, it is a topic that continues to fascinate me. And you did some of the best early work that is that I encountered when I got interested in it. So your book on the topography of Constantinople, the landscape and the monuments and all the antiquities. So this is when Constantinople was being created the first couple of centuries and it accumulated all of these, uh, this ancient art. And so it's kind of this layered book where you have antiquity being brought to Constantinople and repurposed there. And you recently edited the Cambridge Companion to Constantinople. So thank you for doing that too. And today we're going to talk about the other end of the process. So after a thousand years of this city being the capital of a Christian Roman Empire, it's now in the it's the capital of the Ottoman Empire. And its past, its monumental past, is being rediscovered. And so we're going to talk about that process of rediscovery, right? But can you tell us a little bit about so situated in the 16th century, why it was exactly that Constantinople needed to be rediscovered. So, I mean, what's going on in the city that has changed so much that scholars need to start looking for things again? Well, the change really actually began before the Ottoman conquest. And so 
the Constantinople of 1453 was not the Constantinople of 330 or, or 525 or, um, and it had really, um, it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was a it was a, a perhaps the classic example of urban decline. And I, I um, by analogy, you can think of the modern city of Detroit, um, mm. in which there had been a large me metropolitan center with monumental architecture, a central core, residential areas, arteries connecting them, um, but gradually depopulation occurred, um, uh, particularly after the Crusader Sack of 1204, and um, between one thing and another, by the, um, by the end of the 15th century, the city was depopulated. It had um, its monumental buildings, like Hagia Sophia, were still there, but um, other buildings had been abandoned, and it, it was really, in a sense, um, and visitors describe this as a kind of cluster of neighborhoods um, with um, large agricultural spaces in between them. Mm -hmm. So, so there was um, the city, and and many of its major arteries. I think they were still there. It's not altogether clear, but had also been lost, and so it was really a place that had been transformed by um, urban decline. You know, one of the ways I think about that is in, just in terms of the population. Um, so from a high point, well, in the 6th century of half a million, and then possibly again in the 12th century, maybe 400,000 or something like that, it periodically sort of falls again. So after the high point in the 6th century, it falls back down to something around maybe 50 to 100,000. And in the late period, I think by the time you're having the siege, you have maybe 30,000 people in there. But what that means is mathematically is that like one out of every four residential spaces is still inhabited and three of them are abandoned. Like logically, that's what that must mean. Yeah. It's like three quarters abandoned and which is just staggering to think about. Unless you're thinking of Detroit. <laughs> Unless there's Detroit. I have driven through Detroit, yes. <laughs> um, and at the same time, you have a new regime representing a new religion, and they're building their own thing. So they're kind of rebuilding and, and burying and repurposing. Right? Yeah, um, so how absolutely. does that affect the urban fabric? Well, it, it's interesting because um, obviously certain monuments, I'm among them, Hagia Sophia, were of great interest to the Ottomans. And you know they wanted mm -hmm. to preserve them and keep them and use them. And, um, but other things weren't. And so um, certain kinds of things happened. Um, well, you know, the most obvious is um, eventually you get um, Holy Apostles that is raised um, to make way for the Mosque of the Conqueror. So, you know, there there is overt um, transformation of the city. Um, there, um, and then there are other places that are um, churches that become, um, that are taken over and they get used as mosques or for, or repurposed for other reasons. And so the Pantocrator Mosque, mm -hmm. example, uh, Pantocrator Church that becomes, or the Carrier, which um, are taken over and, and repurposed. So um, there were lots of things of that nature going on. And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, we, we tend to talk about the churches and the monumental centers, um, but there is also there is also the, the the aspect of the practical elements of the city. So ports and um, the the ports were all on the Golden Horn side, mm -hmm. and so the street access that was emphasized was um, the street access that would go up to the area around what was formerly the column and forum of Constantine. And that becomes the central, um, the Bedestan, the, the market of, of um, the modern um, city of Istanbul, um, uh, you know, the post conquest city. And so, you know, these, um, 
accumulations of commercial centers then also begin to change the nature and the aspect of the city. Um, with the result that, and and since so much of the city was abandoned in decay, you could, um, and then some stuff was reused. Um, you get um, building around what had been the Forum of Theodosius, um, where parts of the Column of Theodosius are taken and, and put into um, an Ottoman bath building. So, yeah. And it, so it's a transformation that took place in a lot of different ways, like sheer neglect and then coming in and you know, making practical use of what was there, um, and as as well as um, deliberate acts of destruction. Yeah, and as the Ottomans repopulate the city, it becomes another major capital of a new world empire, and all this new population comes in from all over the Balkans and Asia Minor. My understanding is that they often took a very utilitarian approach to the ruins of the monuments that were there, as in, like, these are quarries, essentially, like, yeah. In order to build our own houses and our own, like the Hippodrome in Constantinople just gets eaten up. And I mean, in a certain sense, its materials are all still there. They're just kind of built into all the. They're buildings. reorganized. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was transformed into these other buildings, like a Lego. <laughs> um, so by, you know, the early 16th century, it's not always easy to find things that are mentioned in text. So let's turn to our first uh, sort of guest here, our, our, our first star attraction, who is a Frenchman called Pierre Gilles or Petrus Gilius, uh, depending on whether you're using a French or a, 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 the Latin version of his name. And he is regarded as like the first to start the sort of scholarly rediscovery of Constantinople. Can you tell us a little bit about who he is and what he's doing there? Yeah, so um, he's one of my heroes. <laughs> I think, so um, Petrus Gilius Pierre Gilles was a humanist scholar, um, French, and he, um, I think he came from Albi in the South of France. And, um, and he was, so he was kind of familiar with, um, Rabelais and Guillaume Boudet and um, trained in languages. He he actually wrote a little um, dictionary of Greek and Latin and um, and he was a humanist in that true sense of you know somebody with breadth of inquiry and of uh, his other great publication is <laughs> on um, fish in the Adriatic, which he <laughs> Did, of course, of course to, it is. Um, the names of fish, and uh, and he dedicated it to François Premier Valois, um, with aspirations to being seconded to the Valois court, and it worked. Um, and and François Premier sent him off, um, who was himself interested in um, kind of pursuing diplomatic relations with the Ottomans at a time when nobody else in. Western Europe wanted to, but he thought this was a good idea, capital I. <laughs> yes. And um, and he so he sent a diplomatic mission off, and um, Gilles' uh, mandate was to buy, seek out, and purchase manuscripts for François's personal collection. And he so he was in Constantinople, I think, in fifty. Five to fifty seven. Anyway, but what happened? He was there for a couple of years, and um, he um, and François died, and so he lost. He 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 um, ran out of money, and so signed on as a mercenary with the Ottomans, and went off to, I think Syria, and then at some point there met up with other French diplomats who kind of bought out his commission <laughs> and and um, he hung out in Jerusalem for a while and then came back to France um, before very shortly then going to um, Rome. And his patron who had been, he had been a tutor to um, 
one of Francois's sons or a nephew, I can't remember what it was, um, who was the Duke d'Armagnac, who was then a cardinal. So he went to um, form part of his court in Rome. And that's where he was writing and working on his book on Constantinople when he died, uh, presumably of malaria. Um, and he died prior to completing it. And so it was his, his nephew, Antoine Gilles, who actually um, saw the mostly finished manuscript to press. And so it was published posthumously. Okay, so what's the goal of this book? What is he doing in it? So this book, I mean, um, everybody who works in Constantinople studies mm-hmm. owes an, an enormous debt to this guy because he is basically the person who set about um, not only reconstructing a city that was essentially lost, but also um, laying out a method for doing it. And um, so what Gilles was interested in um, was, uh, in a sense, um, not just any old Constantinople. What he wanted to recover was the city of Constantine and Theodosius and Justinian. So he wanted to recover um, the city in its first several centuries. And to do that, um, he was on the ground in Constantinople. So uh, his work was a combination of on the ground survey work and that um, and textual um, analysis. And his what he did was he he took this document known as the uh, Notitia um, Orbis Constantinopolis, which is a fifth century. Um, it's called a it's a what we call a regionary catalog um, that simply um, takes the city of Constantinople and uh, which was divided into fourteen regions and lists them region by region and says this region is here and it includes and it includes x number of baths it includes x number of houses it includes x number of bread distribution points um, x number of churches and so on and and then lists administrative officials and so forth so what he did was he went through and um and he and so constantinople is a peninsular city and he walked from the tip of the peninsula um westward to um the great surviving monument which were the theodosian walls and um worked out you know where is um zone one where mm-hmm. is region one? Where mm-hmm. is region two? And so he worked through systematically. And then within that, he would look at um, various things and decide, well, I wonder what this is. Is it, you know, um, is it the cistern that's mentioned in region five? Um, and 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 then he looked at things like uh, some of the early histories of Constantinople um, or not early histories of Constantinople, but references to the city and and people like Eusebius and Sonorus and Socrates Scholasticus and and all of these earlier historians and and then um, uh, and I, Sonorus is later, but um, he would um, he he built on those. He looked at Procopius, Suda, I mean, all sorts of stuff, and he would kind of go back and look at it and say well is this this building Mm -hmm. and so um for example the um the um the hospital whose name is escaping me at the moment samson (laughs) the samson hospital thank you the samson hospital um at uh, hagia sophia um he went and he looked around there and thought well let's see, Procopius says this, and um, somebody else says that, and yes, I think this is it. And so mm-hmm. he was really quite um, quite amazing in what he accomplished. And I mean, he made mistakes, obviously, but basically our sense of what that city looked like, you know, how it was organized, where things were, um, is all goes back to Gilles, and everybody who has ever worked on the city um, yes. basically uses his structure and, and his method because um, you, let's face it, it is archaeology is, is 
with rare instances quite impossible. And and so um, one needs um, to use texts. And the and so he figured out how to um, reconcile texts and survey work. And that explains why you called him your hero earlier. Yeah, he's great. Um, he's much better at text than I am. <laughs> I well, I should note on that uh, matter regarding the texts that while we have very many, you know, Greek texts from the Middle Ages that talk about Constantinople and its monuments and 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 give a lot of information, their readers and their authors were kind of new what all these places were and where they were and what they looked like and didn't feel that they have to explain them in great detail. And so we often have these descriptions that are like, you know, things that you and I might like I'm in Chicago, you go, oh, you go to the Sears tower and it's a little bit to the right and you, you know, whatever. And if that's not there and you don't know what it is, it's, it's very difficult to find, especially if it's something like you go to the fishmongers stall and then you, you turn right on the street of the, whatever the Theotokos of something. And, um, it's very difficult afterwards, much less centuries afterwards, to know what those places referred to. In fact, it's even stranger when you have a lot of these sources are written by people who are familiar with the palace, and they're writing what has some people call palace literature. That is, the the layout of the story only makes sense if you know the palace from the inside. <laughs> And if you're not someone who goes to the palace every other day for whatever business, like it, it's completely opaque. Anyway, so I think he's trying to work out a lot of those things that were common sense at the time, uh, but had been lost. The knowledge of those things probably lost possibly even during Byzantine times anyway. Um, right. So can I, a caveat about him being a hero, like I agree with what you're saying. Absolutely. It is a phenomenal work of scholarship, you know, not only for the 16th century, it is enduring and we have translations of it for a reason. But he thought that he was the only person doing this kind of work or no, let me let me rephrase that. He thought that the native population of the city was indifferent to their own antiquities, especially the sort of Greek speaking Orthodox population. And there are many places where he kind of abuses them and, you know, it looks down on them for being not only ignorant, uh, but indifferent and so forth. And this ties in with these strains of humanism at the time, like Western European humanism, which is like this stuff is really ours, not yours. And he does this a little bit and it kind of bothers me because we now know that there were locals who were interested in the antiquities and doing their own kind of research, not this kind of, obviously not this systematic thing. I think it was Peter Schreiner who had written an article on um, Ioannis Malaxos, I think. Anyway, an exact contemporary who's looking into trying to find these old monuments and so forth. Anyway. I'm yeah, no, he, he is yeah. not admirable when it talk, comes to talking about the local population. Yes. <laughs> He had some nasty things to say about the Turks and the 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 local population. And this is very true, and um, he is not to be emulated in that respect. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, it's a great city apart from the people who live. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's jump ahead now. I think by a century, and we come to another major figure who's doing synthetic work, and this is Dukan. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about him? What's his where where is he situated in terms of his sort of cultural production and what's his goal? So Ducange is is also French, um, and uh, but of a very different um sort. So he trained as a lawyer, um Charles Dufresne, Sieur Ducange. <laughs> so he's yes. a French aristocrat. He he uh, trained as a lawyer and then he became the treasurer of France. Um under um in the 17th century and really good 14th and and um he's of course famous for his glossaries in latin and greek um and then he also wrote this um medieval history of byzantium um the historia byzantina which has two volumes one of which is about constantinople and the other is about byzantine genealogy mm -hmm. and um so his his um, Constantinopolitana Christiana um, is his Constantinople volume, which is basically based on Gilles. And so um, 
so it doesn't so what he does is um and unlike Gio, man of action um Ducange is completely an armchair historian so he never went to Constantinople he um worked from the this um in the sanctuary of his own library and um he but he he you know was a crack reader of texts and so he he, basically, he adds to the information that Gilles um, provides and expands upon it um, in his work. So I have a confession. <laughs> so I read the whole thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, OK, so let, let me let me back up. I read enough of each section to get a sense of what it was doing. Uh, because these are all online. These are these books are so old that if I don't think everything's anyone, out of copyright. Yes, it's out of copyright by now. Um, and because he's a very important figure, even in um, just sponsoring editorial activity, uh, sort of publishing yeah. uh, editions of Greek texts. Uh, he helped with a lot of that. And I wanted to see what his sort of view of the Eastern Empire was at the time. Anyway, and you're exactly right. This thing which is called a history is actually an assortment of things. It's a topography, um, as you said. And he he like adds more text to what Gilles had been doing. But then he has prosopographies. He has ruler lists, prosopographies, family connections. Like he's just, it's almost like a early Oxford dictionary, Byzantium kind of, you know, and I think there's a section on just stuff and technical terms and offices. And anyway, this is a very useful compendium um, of, 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 of knowledge about this, uh, and in, including Constantinople, of course. But there's here there's is a political reason, I think. Uh, so this is Louis the Fourteenth, who, you know, so I've read some biographies and just studies of the period of Louis the Fourteenth. They actually did revive the claim that he, as king of France, had inherited the title of the Latin Empire of Constantinople. Really? Yes. So I always that, that, this uh, I'm I'm heartened by this because it confirms an instinct of mine. Oh, what's that? <laughs> well, I had always sort of thought that Louis um, probably had these aspirations to think of himself as a, a you know a kind of. Um, imperial Byzantine figure, but I never pursued it. And so I'm very delighted to hear that um, I was actually right in my hunch. <laughs> yeah. So they, they never press the claim as far as I can tell. But court poetry would remind Louis about, um, you know, Byzance or Constantinople. In these strange contexts, we think I thought, why are they mentioning this here? And I'm like, oh, okay, because it's part of his inherited bundle of titles, <laughs> right? And, well, and this sort of puts the Sun King into some new light too. Yes, <laughs> you know, yes, if you yes. um, go all the way back to Constantine and his solar imagery. Yeah, so th th there is a, a bit of a debate about how much to press this. In other words, was Louis's court that invested in it that there was this brief moment where you know byzantine or what they would have called medieval greek or greek um uh, political ideology would have resonated at the you know at the court and at versailles and so forth and it did uh but there's a, just a question about how much it's just probably a minor element but it was one of these brief moments where that whole package was received favorably in the west because most of the time this was looked down disdainfully and you know those corrupt degenerate greeks and so forth um so and and this was the period also when i think the term decadence appears in the in the french repertoire of thinking about the eastern empire maybe it was a little bit earlier in fact i think there was a yeah, no, there was a 16th century precedent. You know what it was? I remember now. The French translator of Laonikos Chalcokonvilis, the Greek historian of the fall, 
mm-hmm. he translated Hakko Konzili's as as uh, as decadence as the sort oh, of decadence okay. of the yeah 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 and hmm. and that comes back in the 17th century as well anyway all course, very interesting yeah 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 <laughs> in 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 French of course decadence has a little bit more of a glamour to it than our English decadence it does yeah yes. Everything sounds better in French. <laughs> no, I'm not just saying it sounds better. It it has a luster to it, you know. That anyway. Um... Well, the way that words do, they um they have certain overtones in one language that they don't have in another. Yes, yes. It, this lasts, by the way, in the French tradition down to the 20th century. Charles Charles Dio could, <laughs> in his mind, at least plausibly argue that by associating Byzantium with decadence, he was doing it a favor. Oh, okay. Yes. He thought that was a rehabilitation. That because okay. it makes it more interesting and attractive. That, like this, that this was um, the thing that made us understand what decadence is or in, in what sense a rehabilitation? Uh, he, he explains this, uh, I think, in some length. Uh, um, that... Yes, there was all this decline and fall, and yes, it was um, a struggling state, and it was corrupt and theocratic, and you know all of these kind of enlightenment biases as well. But it had this glamour to it that made it so fascinating and alluring and appealing. Like it was decline, but it was decline with style. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This oh, there was great. a time when this could be taken seriously, and. And he, I think he liked it for that reason. Like he genuinely loved it and spent his whole life promoting it and its art and its culture and everything. But that was how he he saw it. It was, I don't know, maybe in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, you could do things that you can't do today. Or, oh, anyway. you certainly could. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and he, of course, fell in line with the whole Orientalist reading like of Strugowski about the art. Yeah, he went all in. So his um, I was actually looking through his like, what is it? 800 page manual of Byzantine art. Yeah, no, that it's. Yes. A bookmark, a book, uh, a doorstop. doorstop. <laughs> and and he embraces Orientalism hard. Um, anyway, that's a in, in fact, at one of the world's fairs, it was the French and the Greeks, as in from the Ministry of Culture in Greece, who clashed over whether the Byzantine material should be classified as Oriental or Hellenic. Oh, that's really interesting. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Mm. Because, you know, everybody, I mean, Charles Rufus Morey, in his book on, um, his book on early Christian art, um, and he he talks about, um, and Dalton, Ormond Dalton at, at the British Museum, they are great you know they talk about how fabulous this stuff is and then they say but you know <laughs> there was nothing better than polycolitis from the fifth century BC. Right. that was the apogee but this stuff um and it it's they call it oriental they call it decadent they call it um you know, perfumed and and yeah, using yeah. all of that language, um, even as they're saying, um, it's fabulous, but it's not so great as, as the truly classical stuff. Of course, yeah. I mean, let's not go too far here. <laughs> all right, so we, we digressed a little bit from finding Constantinople. So we have these early scholars uh, based on Gilles' work. There's a lot of philology that is accruing around the study of the places and monuments of Constantinople. At what point do we start to get more um, on the ground research, possibly even excavation? So like, what's what's the history? Are there any major excavations that take place in Constantinople? Well, the first one was um, in the mid 19th century by Charles Newton. And this comes after so there there are travelers to Constantinople from the west and and again they're looking for um the materials of classical civilization basically is kind of what they're up to um and they do so um Grelo and Spond and Wheeler and these guys and 
they, there are certain places, certain set places that they see when they go to Constantinople. Um, so they visit the, um, the Hippodrome, the Column of Constantine, um, the Column of Arcadius, which was still standing into the 18th century. They see the Golden Gate, which still had its propylon with its sculpture on it. So there are certain sort of set pieces that they see, but um, nothing beyond that. But um, it was Charles Newton who um, was... A devo he was a devotee of Winkelmann's. I mean, he, he had read all of Winkelmann's stuff and he was very interested in um, sort of history of uh, history of art. And um, he's the guy who um, who excavated the mausoleum of Holly at uh, Halicarnassus. And he he started, I think it was in the 1840s at the British Museum where he was a an assistant to one of the keepers of the British Museum. And then I don't know quite how this worked out, whether how he maintained this position, but then he he went um, to the Eastern Mediterranean and he was um, assigned, he was a vice consul at, at Mytilene. He That's right. uh, um, was on roads. He um, anyway, at some point he, he was um, in Constantinople um, and um, he got permission <laughs> to excavate in the Hippodrome around the Serpent Column. Um, and he, he um, recounts this in his Travels and Discoveries in the Levant, which is a, a two-volume thing. So um, anyway, uh, he spent three days excavating around the Serpent Column. And um, he you know, made certain observations that um, it was um, the ground level had been disturbed largely from the construction of the Sultan Ahmet Mosque, the Blue Mosque. So, it, you know, a, a high level there was excavated. Um, and he got down to sort of um, the, um, the lower level and then left it. Um, and so he never actually completed that excavation. And I um, I'm not altogether sure why he didn't complete it. Um, it was subsequently finished by um, Frick and um, Dethier, who came in and went all the way down and cleaned it up. And they're the guys who found the inscription on it um, mm. that said, and that I think happened about a year later. And so um when he's writing about it, um, Dalton says, oh, I'm so sorry that I didn't finish it. And, you know, this is what these guys have found and it's, um, it's, it's great and so on and so forth. So, so that was the first excavation in the Hippodrome. And then a couple of years later, that led subsequently to um, people digging out around the obelisk of Theodosius and going down and finding um, those inscriptions and the the lower reliefs that show the, the bringing of the obelisk in and the um, the spina with the horses racing around it. Um, yeah. And uh, and then the third thing that they did was um, the built obelisk. They then turned attention to that, and so those three things. So, so that was all kind of in the late eighteen fifties, early eighteen sixties. And so those were the first excavations in the Hippodrome. And then there's kind of a long drought. Um, the British Academy then sponsored, excuse me, um, excavations in the 1920s, 1927 and 1928, Stanley Casson and his crew. And um, they were working again in the Hippodrome, but also, in the environs, so that they're the guys who excavated the Baths of Lucifus. Right. And they also went down the road and worked um, in the form of Theodosius and um, the um, and at the Golden Gate um, in those two years. And so um, those were the um, and and of course, interestingly, these are all 
um, excavations that kind of are looking at the places that people liked to go visit um, that were on, on the path, um, the tourist path. And, um, and so, and then um, the Walker Trust um, sponsored excavations uh, around the Great Palace in the 1930s that then get interrupted because of the war and then um, pick up again in the 1950s for a couple of years. So, um, and so those have been, were the major early, the so-called earlier excavations. And then the, the other great major one was the recent um, um, Yenikapi, the Theodosian port excavations, which went on right. for, for a long time um, and um, excavating the port and then recent excavations um, around the great palace that, um, and the Kolpiki gate and so forth. Yeah, it is extraordinarily difficult to dig in a city like this, and for all kinds of reasons, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, you, you know, some every time I go to the Hippodrome, I fantasize about the whole thing just being dug up. And I don't think it would be, like, I don't see why it can't be, unless the tour bus operators... They would have such, no place to park. Right. <laughs> and they must be a very powerful lobby. But otherwise... And you dig the whole thing down to the found to the surface of the original racetrack. It would be about a football sized. Yes, it would be a depression. But if you you know add ramps and stairs to kind of simulate the effect of the hippodrome stands, mm -hmm. it would be this very wide open area. You could expose the whole hippodrome. It would be an archaeological park. I don't know that it would be less attractive to stroll down than what we have now. But anyway, I'm just fantasizing. Right. Well, it's a nice fantasy. Yes. There's a reason we have fantasy lives. <laughs> I mean, it's all there. Just you got to just dig it up. Um, and anyway, now what about survey work? Has there been any major survey? Work? I'm thinking in particular of the walls. Yeah. So um, the survey work started um, well, Gilles with Gilles, but um, also um, so 19th century Alexander van Millingen. Um, so who was, um, I didn't know this until quite recently. He was actually born in Istanbul, oh. in Constantinople. His father was the personal doctor to the Sultan. Well, there you go. Um, anyway, so he, he was born there and raised there. He was an American, but he went to school in Edinburgh um, and was ordained as, a, I think, a Presbyterian minister at some point, and then came back and taught at Robert College. Um, and uh, so he did survey work of the walls and then first and then subsequently the churches of um, the city. And, um, and so he went around and, and looked at the walls and recorded their inscriptions and, um, and his stated purpose was to recover the monuments um, that are the backdrop of Byzantine Christian history, basically. And um, overtly, he, he, he does so. He says that Constantinople was the bulwark of civilization against um, sure. the, the onslaught of, of the Turks. Yes. Um, and so um, this is much of his driving force. So to create this kind of um, to to discover these places to to bring to life the the, um, the buildings that um, were the stage set really for Byzantine history. Yeah, I've seen this idea, um, and and especially it's focalized on the walls, and it still kind of is this idea that those walls are what pro quote protected Europe from you know the mm -hmm. Muslims or the Arabs or the Turks or you know you name it. It's a very old idea. You know, the first attestation of it is in 12th century. Anyway, that's a, no. it's a persistent Western European idea. Anyway, it's, it's again, it's the utilitarian view of the Eastern Empire. Like, what have you done for us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As if they didn't have enough reason to do it for themselves. Um, so a lot of this reconstruction, be, because the scope for excavation and even survey really is limited, 
so much of what we know is working on texts. And so I just wanted to ask you if you had, and, and you've also, you know, done a lot of work on monuments, but through texts. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the uh, sort of advantages and disadvantages um, that that predicament has left us with? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, advantages, they tell us what was there. Um, and, and, and if you can, if you can link a building to a place, you can often get information about um, who built it, patronage, stuff like that, but very often you can't. Um, so texts are limited because um, they don't tell us what we want to know. <laughs> and they, they don't, um, in terms of practical information. And as you were saying before, I mean, they're written by people who are familiar with this stuff for people who are essentially familiar with this stuff and for whom these monuments and these places like is not are not the primary reason for their writing about something it, it's mm -hmm. an aside um it's for some other reason a, a reference to the column of constantine will appear you know and then they went to the forum with the column of constantine and mm -hmm. did x y and z there that's the kind of um thing so um they can be very um, frustrating in that regard. Um, at the same time, they can be transformative. And so, for example, um, <laughs> uh, or I, how best to put this? Well, if you think of the example of the Baz of Zuxibus, so there, as you know, there's this long ephesus about the sculpture that was in the baths. Yeah. And nobody actually believed that it <laughs> was true. Really? <laughs> no, it was like, oh, this guy made this up. And and this is a, a description. I mean, these are discussions that art historians um, often had. Um, and so philosophers imagines were these real paintings or right, was this made right. up? You know, that yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. Well, everybody thought this was made up. And then um when Stanley Casson um was doing the the excavations in uh, the Baths of Zuxifus, they came up with these bases that were inscribed with the very names of the very sculptures <laughs> that right. were so right. Achilles and Hecuba and stuff like that, and Ascines. Um and so, lo and behold, whoa! Um, and similarly, the um, uh, the uh, the texts for um, Hagias Polyuktas, mm -hmm. um, when that material was excavated um, by Mango and Shevchenko and and Harrison, um, lo there was this big inscription that matched that text, and so um, the texts kind of confirm um can confirm archaeological discovery um and and remind people that they ought to have um greater imagination <laughs> and, and 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 the the texts also and and i think this is the real really useful thing about texts especially things um that seem so unprepossessing or or texts like um the Mahayas Polyuktas inscription or the Baz of Zuxippus or Photius on the um the um Theodicus in, in Hagia Sophia. Um I have my students read this stuff and they just it's like why are we reading this? And then and so as, as Ruth Webb and Liz James have um, so well demonstrated, you know, these texts are not descriptions, <laughs> you know, right. what they are are evocations and, yeah. and they're a kind of a guide to, to how we ought to think about, um, about how, what people thought of these things. And, and I think, you know, when you're, reconstructing when you're trying to reconstruct 
anything, um, much less an urban environment. Um, it's tempting to think of these places simply in terms of their material structure, their built environment. But of course, the built environment was created by a population to serve its needs. And so, um, and so it's administrative structure and the kinds of institutions it has and therefore the kinds of buildings and the kinds of decoration that it has um, are all determined by that population. And these texts, um, their great advantage is that they open the door a crack into imagining what these places were like for the people who, um, and, and for imagining the very people who, who operated within them. Yeah. So, I mean, the texts, depending on their genre, have these different functions. And but in, in some cases, it is to convey an impression of the way in which a, a monument or some artwork inside it or whatever, that how it impacts the viewer. Mm -hmm. She has these very subjective kinds of, re, you know, viewer responses. They're not descriptions exactly of what is causing them because they could all see that. Like they didn't necessarily need to be told, you know, such and such is next to this and that or whatever. Um, and so they're often very evocative in this way. Sometimes they're elusive. But I also am, I, I too am just so fascinated by these texts that existed in like an, a hard copy in a sense on the building, but were also written down and transmitted textually. And it's not until... 1500 years later or whatever that these two strands come together when the, the inscription is excavated and you, and you or the statue base is found and like those two things are reunited again i don't know i i just think that's really something and so one of the most difficult places for us to access by the way i think we should say this is the great palace mm -hmm. which is let me put it like this it's probably the most important place that is so opaque to us because almost all of it is lost and or the foundations are buried under things that we can't possibly get under um and i was just showing you earlier last year i read uh westbrook's the great palace in constantinople and architectural interpretation mm -hmm. and it's a fascinating thing. and for me this is like the first book study that i've read that made me feel okay i i have a bit of a handle on it now it's it's really well done. I, I think I'm not an expert on this type of material, but it, it's convincing. What I loved about the palace as a problem is how much we're dealing with these texts <laughs> that basically you're looking at them and say, okay, so this hall is to the right of that one. Like, I don't know where they are absolutely, but everyone was drawing these schematic diagrams where right. we can put things in relation to each other, but not on any fixed place. Mm -hmm. And I think he, uh, Westbrook, tries to fix a few of these. And once you fix a few of them, then some of the others get nailed down and it starts to look more like a real place. Yeah, I haven't read it. And um, since I, I've been so embroiled in trying to finish my own um, project, <laughs> I haven't read a lot of stuff that's come out. But, um, you know, I think he's an architect himself. Yeah. And I think that that um, will, will be an interesting read. Oh, yes. He's got a lot of these schematics that lots of schematics, three-dimensional plans and everything. Um, reconstruction of Sigma and triconch axonometric. <laughs> okay. Good parenthesis, author. <laughs> All right. Um, so you mentioned it. So tell us, what is your next project, by the way? I finished it. It's it's in, in production. <laughs> oh, Congratulations. <laughs> Um, das Buch, as it, as it is known in my household, um, <laughs> which has been a torment for the past decade. <laughs> okay. Um, so the title, which is not my own, which was assigned by the press, um, is Ancients and Moderns on, no, Style and Meaning in Late Antiquity, colon, Ancients and Moderns on Seeing and Thinking. Wow. Yeah, it's cumbersome. Um, 
What um, would you have? Well, no, no. Okay, it is. That's the title. So let's not. Yeah, my my um, my title was Ancients and Moderns on Late Antique Style. Oh. And that yeah. was deemed kind of boring. Okay, I don't. I I I honestly can't tell. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I liked it because it was succinct, but I'm not a publisher. So anyway, um. Mm. I defer to their wisdom. Sure. We, yes, we do. And um, anyway, this is a book that is um, about, what, it's in two parts. And part one is, you know, why do we think about late antique art as abstract and spiritual? Yes. Where did that come from? Because I have always found that very problematic in, in yes. dealing with, writing about late antique art i don't think it's abstract and spiritual <laughs> agreed though I, um, couldn't, I couldn't document anything and part two is if we don't think it's abstract and spiritual how are we going to write about it so right. you know wow. how are we going to understand it so what part one is about is basically the invention of an idea of late antique art and uh, it's looking at regal and vikoff and stragowski there were two definitions that really arose. Vikoff described late antique art as illusionistic in a direct line of descent from, you know, Roman art. Yeah. And um, Regal describes that, no, no, no. It's, it's what he called crystalline and what came to be called abstract. And, um, but he thought too that that was in a direct line of descent from Roman art. And ultimately, Regal's um, idea won out. And, and Regal was, um, he n was not quite so explicit about spirituality. He said that this, this, what we call abstract style, his crystalline style, could be connected to the writings of um, Plotinus, yes, yes, which he never demonstrated, and um, he didn't even talk about Plotinus. And it could be, and but he did connect it to Augustine's work on music. Um, so this sounds fascinating. Yes, it's, it's not our very, topic. <laughs> it's very close to a lot of my interests. And so I'm thinking I will get Das Buch when it comes out and we can have another discussion about it. Okay. But I mean, I'm I'm fascinated by this because I am also sort of very skeptical about spirituality as an analytical category. And yet I don't know where exactly it came from <laughs> um, and how it was defined and why we use it. So I I will definitely look into this and we will talk about late antique art once it comes out. But for now, I'll link people to your works on Constantinople and its exploration. And there is still so much more to be done uh, in and on Constantinople. Yes, um, it's, there's lots that needs to be done. And so, um, yeah, so thank you, Sarah, for coming on and uh, talking to us about that. Well, thank you for having me. It was, it was fun. Yeah, I look forward to doing it again. So take care in the meantime. You too. Bye. Bye.